Good morning. morning. I'm Pastor Amanda, and I am so delighted that we are gathered here at this time in this place to worship God together this morning. Hope you've been, well, you've certainly been visiting and catching up with one another, which is wonderful. We have had some announcements scrolling here, and so I hope you've taken note of that. Looks like there's a great book discussion coming up with the mission team, uh, and so make note of that. And the fellowship committee has planned a welcome for our family next Sunday, so I do hope you can come to worship and to linger a little longer afterwards and join together. I uh, just and we are enjoying very much getting to know you all and and learn your names and hear your stories. And so looking forward to that next Sunday. And just one housekeeping type note. There is a red registration pad in each of the pews, and so it is wonderful if you would find that and sign in and pass it down the pew if there are others there with you and let them sign it and pass it back. This is one way you might even sneak a look at that attendance pad and learn the name of someone if you don't know who's in that same pew as you. Uh, But we thank you for helping us keep track of those who are worshiping together today. As we enter into the presence of God, Let us just sit back, focus on the Lord, and enjoy our prelude.
And now, as we continue worshiping, I would love to have the children come on up and join me up on the steps. I've got some friends here, yay. Come on up. Come on up. Well, as always, I am so glad that you all are here with me this morning. Hi, come on up, wherever you're comfortable. Now, it's, it's not a huge thing that I've brought with me this morning. Joey's not going to see it. But can you guys tell me what I've got here? What's this made of? Legos. Legos. Yes. I brought, oh, see, you want to see that? <laughs> I brought Legos this morning. Now, at my house, I have two wonderful sons who love to build Legos. My oldest son, Mason, particularly loves to build Legos, and he's the one who made this little church for me. Because you know what we do with Legos, right? It's like all of these little bricks of different sizes and different colors. And, and now, I mean, there's even this one that looks like a dome, just like on the top of this church building. And there's some that are, you know, have angles and are like little triangles or different things. And so out of all of the, what I swear are a million bricks of Legos at my house, I said, do you think, I asked Mason, I said, I'm going to talk about building. Do you think you can pull together a church? And out of what he just had laying around, he made me something that definitely looks like a little church. You know, it's got a little steeple up here, and I'm sure there's best, you know, could have a door there. And so it's really cool how we can be, as people, we can be creative with building materials around us, and we can put together things and recognize what they are. Well, I'm talking about this because when I say a little bit more to the, to the grown-ups later in the sermon, we are talking about how we, as people, as followers of Jesus, are being built up by God into a place for God to live. Now, do you think we have to form a human pyramid? What? You don't think so? You don't think we have to just pile ourselves up together as a human pyramid for God to dwell? No, that'd be kind of silly, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be pretty silly. I think we'd fall over. But just like... Maybe you all, if you've built Legos, or like my kids, or my husband <laughs> builds Legos, they all snap together and we can make things that, that are really fun, that are sometimes just, you know, beautiful and silly, or some of them functional, they do all sorts of things. Well, just like we can build with Legos, or blocks, or, you know, clay, or whatever, God, we are God's Legos. We come in different shapes and sizes and colors, and some of us have sharp edges, and some of us have curves, and all those different things, and God uses us as building materials and puts us together in such a way that God wants to live among us, and that is just a cool thing, and so I want you all, as you keep coming to church, and as you study scripture, and as you pray, and as you do all those kinds of things, and as you're kind, I want you to know that you are being built up by God to be a place where God lives. Let's pray. Lord God, I give you such thanks for these children and all the children in the life of this and every church. We pray that we, who are the church, are raising them and helping them to know what it means to be built up together as a place where you will dwell. And so, Lord, I just pray your blessing upon them and that they will continue to grow in, in grace and truth just to know you and to be like you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, and you all are dismissed to go on and worship at Kid Life. <laughs> Would you please stand in body or spirit and join with me in the call to worship? <clears throat> we gather together in the name of Jesus Christ, members, members of, of God's, God's family, family and, and brothers, brothers and sisters to one another. There are no outsiders here among us. No, no one has any special standing or bragging rights, for we have been brought together by the redeeming love of Jesus. 
Let's join together in worship. You can remain standing for our first hymn, page 170. seated. Let's join together in this opening prayer. Almighty God, you have built your church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Join us together in unity of spirit by their teaching that we may become a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Well, as we continue on worshiping, I will simply uh, remind us as we head into a moment of our offering that our gifts and tithes and offerings, they are an act of worship. Now, whether you do that by putting it in the plate on the way in or out of the sanctuary today or, you know, through your online banking or whatever the case may be, it is an act of worship how we use our resources. And so just thank you for all the ways that you support uh, Decatur First United Methodist Church and all the ways that you're generous with that which God has given you. I would just like to offer a word of prayer over our, our giving. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for all that you have given to us, and we pray for the wisdom to steward it well. And so, Lord, for the gifts that have come to support the ministries of this church, we particularly ask your blessing that your kingdom may grow through our, our efforts. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come into this time of prayer, I will leave a few moments of silence in which you can lift up the names of those for whom you would like to intercede. Folks may be going through a tough time or the, the names of those with whom you are celebrating good things. Lift those up to the Lord as well. But we'll just have a few moments of silence and then I'll pray us a pastoral prayer and then we'll pray together the Lord's Prayer. So let us come into the presence of God in prayer.
O oh God who hears us, thank you for hearing those who are on our hearts, on our minds this day. Thank you for always hearing us when we come to you in prayer. We pray that the fullness of your spirit, your abundant spirit, would be poured out upon those who are in need, in need of encouragement, in need of companionship, in need of an advocate, in need of, of connection and healing and strength. And Lord God, we pray that, that you would fill us. Lately, we've been reminded that as the rain falls, it can saturate the ground. Lord, I pray that you would so pour your spirit upon us that we would be saturated, that we would not be drowned or in danger, but that you would fill us to the full capacity with which we can hold you and maybe just a little extra to pour out upon those around us. For in you, God, there is fullness, fullness of goodness, fullness of faithfulness, fullness of just real life, not perfect, not unblemished, but still beautiful and always beloved. And Lord God, to participate in the coming of the fullness of your glory, we pray together in the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I would invite you to stand as you are able for our hymn of preparation, O Church of God United, number 547. <laughs>
So we come to our scripture lesson today. It is from the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Here now, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. So remember that once you were Gentiles by physical descent who were called uncircumcised by Jews who were physically circumcised. At that time, you were without Christ. You were aliens rather than citizens of Israel and strangers to the covenants of God's promise. In this world, you had no hope and no God, but now, thanks to Christ Jesus, you who once were so far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Christ is our peace. He made both Jews and Gentiles into one group. With his body, he broke down the barrier of hatred that divided us. He canceled the detailed rules of the law so that he could create one new person out of the two groups, making peace. He reconciled them both as one body to God by the cross, which ended the hostility to God. When he came, he announced the good news of peace to you who were far away from God and to those who were near. We both have access to the Father through Christ by the one Spirit. So now you are no longer strangers and aliens. Rather, you are fellow citizens with God's people, and you belong to God's household. As God's household, you are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building is joined together in him, and it grows up into a temple that is dedicated to the Lord. Christ is building you into a place where God lives through the Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So today, and for the next few weeks, we're going to walk through uh, chunks of Paul's letter to the churches at Ephesus. And when we hear the words of Paul, we do need to remember that he was not sitting down to author a generic academic paper designed to be read a couple thousand years later uh, by us as if he could know what life would be like. He was a church planter, pastor, missionary who cared very much about specific people in specific places in specific circumstances. And he wrote letters to them, right, as a way to communicate his best guidance as one with relationship with them as to how to best live out the good news that Jesus proclaimed and for which Jesus ultimately died. And in this particular part of, of the letter, there are many beautiful statements, as with most scripture lessons, you know, that, that we come to study together. And I invite you to get the full richness of the scripture to read these verses again later this week and see what the Spirit might have for your own edification. But I want to start for our time together today with that statement where Paul writes that Jesus came and ended the hostility to God. I don't know about you, but just as I was preparing for today and as I was reading this scripture, you know, not for the first time, but somehow that particular phrasing of the accomplishment of the cross of Christ, that it ended the hostility then of humanity to God, that really kind of stopped me in my tracks. It was a woe moment. Jesus came because we were the hostile ones? That word, you know, we're used to being sinners, you know, we're used to using other language around it, but it kind of brought me up short thinking we were hostile to God. Now, of course, that's not a huge surprise in the general understanding of, you know, the need for Jesus to come and be our Savior. We know that we're sinners and all have fallen short of the glory of God, right? But, but this particular wording might cause some of us to ponder and linger with the word of God, maybe an extra moment. Jesus came to end our cumulative hostility to God. Came to be our peace, to bring peace, to make peace. Came to bring us into alignment with God's gentleness and patience and goodness. This is good news. Now, some theologies of God would highlight and linger what I would say maybe is a bit too long with the, the mentions of God's wrath as if all of the scriptures about God's merciful nature and benevolent nature aren't quite as true or as powerful as good. But, oh, church, they are. God is love. God is merciful and desires mercy. God is faithful. God is holy. And God's nature is not the problem that Jesus came to resolve. 
We wrestle often in the broader church culture about the nature of God, and it just, it just smacked me right in the face that Jesus did not come to fix anything about God. God doesn't need fixing. But Jesus came to restore, to redeem humanity's hostility, anger, pain, brokenness. This is what came, Jesus came to redeem through resurrection and restoration. And Paul writes so beautifully that Christ is our peace. And Christ broke down barriers, canceled rules, and made new spaces and places for belonging. Christ did this as the fulfillment of the good news that he announced. Jesus said he was going to do it, and then Jesus did it. And then we are here, filled with the Spirit, to carry it out as well. Christ did this to fulfill that good news that he announced about peace, announced to those who were far away from God, you know, those who were maybe unfamiliar with God, or, or those who were wounded by things done in the name of that wrathful God, or those who had wandered away from God, or kind of like the prodigal son ran defiantly away from God for a time, and to, announced it to those who were near. The 99, you know, out of the 100. Those who've been raised in the church, maybe. All were told the good news. And then we, who, who have inherited this work of the gospel, we are called to be Christ-like. So just like Christ Jesus, our Lord, we, the church, we are still both hearing that good news and sharing it with those far from God and near to God. Because really all of us need to hear the good news. The ones near to God and the ones far from God, then through this sharing in the good news of God, are brought together on the same foundation, brought into new relational space in which peace is lived in real time. Now, I find this good news that the Apostle Paul proclaims to maybe be a little challenging to hear all these hundreds and hundreds of years removed from when he wrote them. The peace that Christ Jesus brought upon the earth is not yet made complete. But Paul's words ring true as a very real option, not just some pie-in-the-sky thing that, oh, wouldn't it be nice if? No, it's real, and it's possible, and it's available to us. Peace is available for us to live in real time in this world as we know it. And I hope that, you know, I'm not just putting icing on the cake here. It's real. No matter where we see divisions, no matter where we hear arguments, the peace of Christ is a very real option for us. And sometimes I think we forget that it's, it's available right now, not just in eternity. Paul describes to the Ephesians a new way of being built up and assembled together as the household of God, as the establishment of God, within which, you know, and this to me is the big news, within which God will dwell. Now, I really suspect that when Paul wrote this description, he kind of thought that the place would be built by now. But here we are, still a work in progress, and I think that's okay. You know, especially as we slowed down for this whole pandemic wildness, I really thought about time and the passage of time. And, and our God is Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, first and last. And so I wonder if we may not be moving quite as slow as we think we are. We're just still being built up into a dwelling place for God Almighty. And we are part already of God's household of God right here as the people of Decatur First United Methodist Church. We are each of us parts of a bigger whole, and we are also still being assembled, put together in functional and pleasing configurations with the goal of holding holiness. That's what it means for God to come and dwell with us. We hold holiness, being a dwelling place for God. Now, a big question that comes up for me when I think of holding holiness is how do we do that? How do we make our lives and our community into the kind of place where God will dwell? Now, for me, I think we have to see what that, that place looks like. You know, if you're an architect, you have blueprints from which you build something, right? And so there are places in Scripture that I think give us the blueprints. And one of those is part of John's revelation. So I want to read Revelation chapter 21, verses 2 to 4. Now, we often hear this in the context of like a funeral or All Saints Sunday or something like that. But this is, this is a blueprint of what God has in store for us. And John writes, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. 
I heard a loud voice from the throne say, look, God's dwelling is here with humankind. He will dwell with them and they will be his peoples. God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no mourning, crying, or pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Now, we usually hear, again, these words, you know, in a very specific kind of setting. But this is a vision of what it will look like, feel like, when God takes up residence amongst God's peoples. There will be no mourning or crying or pain because, I would argue, there is no more violence or hatred or malice or shame, among other things. And we who are here right now trying to live into and toward and, and, and be builders of this vision, we can live in that direction because of something else that the Apostle Paul wrote. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, he had been talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the way the Spirit indwells God's people and, and works us together. And at the very end of that chapter, he says, now use your ambition to try to get the greater gifts, and I'm going to show you an even better way. Now, Paul wrote these words that have been used at countless weddings, right? But our, pow our powerful vision of the kind of building material. You know, if you have your blueprints, you also have to have your list of materials. You have to know what it is you're putting together to build something, what you got to work with. And so I'm going to share 1 Corinthians 13, but just as you may be used to it as kind of a lovey-dovey set of verses read at a wedding, I will invite you to pull it out of just that one context and bring it into the fullness of what Paul is really inviting the church to be, the people of God to be, in their everyday lives. Here, 1 Corinthians 13. Now, if I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all the mysteries and everything else, anybody know it all? If I have all that, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything that I have and hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. Now, don't some of these things just rub if this is what love is? Whew. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As for prophecies, they will be brought to an end. As for tongues, they will stop. As for knowledge, it will be brought to an end. We know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, what is partial will be brought to an end. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child. But now that I have become a man, I have put an end to childish things. Now we see a reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know partially, but then I will know completely in the same way that I have been completely known. Now notice this is relational, not just intellectual. And now faith, hope, and love remain these three things. And the greatest of these is love. So friends, the materials with which we will build toward that vision where there's no mourning or crying or pain, they are the things of love. And the materials that will be useful in creating a dwelling place for God to reside through the Spirit, I would invite us to, in our imaginations, think that those building mater materials might be a little more squishy than rigid, a little more wonky and irregular than regulated and uniform, might be, at times, more beautiful than they are functional. Now, as someone who loves functional stuff, that one is one that I have to stop and slow down and pay attention to. And the building materials might be more tender than terse. And I really invite us 
to imagine what it might be like for each of us to be increasingly made into such substantial building materials so that we, the people of God, might be put together, assembled and reassembled and reconfigured like a big old pile of Legos, be put together in ways that hold the absolutely most holiness possible. We can do this. God's Spirit is with us. And now I would invite us to join together in a modern affirmation of our faith, which is number 885 in the hymnal. Would you stand for this affirmation? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. And now as we are in a posture of worship, let us join together in our hymn of response, God be with you, till we meet again, number 672.
In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.